The Works of Josephus Book 18 Containing the Interval of 32 Years From the Banishment of Archelaus to the Departure of the Jews from Babylon Chapter 1 How Cyrenius was sent by Caesar to make a taxation of Syria and Judea and how Coponius was sent to be procurator of Judea, concerning Judas of Galilee, and concerning the sects that were among the Jews. Now Cyrenius, a Roman senator, and one who had gone through other magistracies, and had passed through them till he had been consul, and one who, on other accounts, was of great dignity, came at this time into Syria, with a few others, being sent by Caesar to be a judge of that nation, and to take an account of their substance. Coponius also, a man of the equestrian order, was sent together with him to have the supreme power over the Jews. Moreover, Cyrenius came himself into Judea, which was now added to the province of Syria, to take an account of their substance and to dispose of Archelaus's money. But the Jews, although at the beginning they took the report of a taxation heinously, yet did they leave off any farther opposition to it by the persuasion of Joazar who was the son of Boethus and high priest. So they, being over-persuaded by Joazar's words, gave an account of their estates without any dispute about it. Yet there was one Judas, a Golanite of a city whose name was Gamala, who, taking with him Sadoc, a Pharisee, became zealous to draw them to a revolt, who both said that this taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery, and exhorted the nation to assert their liberty as if they could procure them happiness and security for what they possessed, and an assured enjoyment of a still greater good, which was that of the honor and glory they would thereby acquire for magnanimity. They also said that God would not otherwise be assisting to them than upon their joining with one another in such counsels as might be successful and for their own advantage, and this especially if they would set about great exploits and not grow weary in executing the same. So men received what they said with pleasure, and this bold attempt proceeded to a great height. All sorts of misfortunes also sprang from these men, and the nation was infected with this doctrine to an incredible degree. One violent war came upon us after another, and we lost our friends, who used to alleviate our pains. There were also very great robberies and murders of our principal men. This was done in pretense indeed for the public welfare, but in reality for the hopes of gain to themselves. Once arose seditions, and from them murders of men, which sometimes fell on those of their own people, by the madness of these men towards one another, while their desire was that none of the adverse party might be left, and sometimes on their enemies. A famine also coming upon us reduced us to the last degree of despair, as did also the taking and demolishing of cities. Nay, the sedition at last increased so high that the very temple of God was burnt down by their enemies' fire. Such were the consequences of this, that the customs of our fathers were altered and such a change was made, as added a mighty weight towards bringing all to destruction, which these men occasioned by thus conspiring together. For Judas and Sadoc, who excited a fourth philosophic sect among us, and had a great many followers therein, filled our civil government with tumults at present, and laid the foundation of our future miseries by this system of philosophy, which we were before unacquainted with all concerning which I shall discourse a little, and to this the rather, because the infection which spread thence among the younger sort, who were zealous for it, brought the public to destruction. The Jews had for a great while three sects of philosophy peculiar to themselves, the sect of the Essenes, and the sect of the Sadducees, and the third sort of opinions was that of those called Pharisees, of which sects, although I have already spoken in the second book of the Jewish war, yet will I a little touch upon them now. Now, for the Pharisees, they live meanly and despise delicacies in diet, and they follow the conduct of reason, and what that prescribes to them as good for them they do, and they think they ought earnestly to strive and observe reason's dictates for practice. They also pay a respect to such as are in years, nor are they so bold as to contradict them in anything which they have introduced, and, when they determine that all things are done by fate, they do not take away the freedom from men of acting as they think fit, since their notion is that it hath pleased God to make a temperament, whereby what he wills is done, but so that the will of men can act virtuously or viciously. 
They also believe that souls have an immortal vigor in them, and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in this life. And the latter are to be detained in an everlasting prison, but that the former shall have power to revive and live again, on account of which doctrines they are able greatly to persuade the body of the people, and whatsoever they do about divine worship, prayers, and sacrifices, they perform them according to their direction, insomuch that the cities gave great attestations to them, on account of their entire virtuous conduct, both in the actions of their lives and their discourses also. But the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies, nor do they regard the observation of anything besides what the law enjoins them, for they think it an instance of virtue to dispute with those teachers of philosophy whom they frequent. But this doctrine is received but by a few, yet by those still of the greatest dignity. But they are able to do almost nothing of themselves, for when they become magistrates, as they are unwillingly and by force sometimes obliged to be, they addict themselves to the notions of the Pharisees, because the multitude would not otherwise bear them. The doctrine of the Essenes is this, that all things are best ascribed to God. They teach the immortality of souls, and esteem that the rewards of righteousness are to be earnestly striven for. And when they send what they have dedicated to God into the temple, they do not offer sacrifices, because they have more pure lustrations of their own, on which account they are excluded from the common court of the temple, but offer their sacrifices themselves. Yet is their course of life better than that of other men, and they entirely addict themselves to husbandry, it also deserves our admiration how much they exceed all other men that addict themselves to virtue, and this in righteousness, and indeed to such a degree that it hath never appeared among any other man, neither Greeks nor barbarians, no, not for a little time, so it hath endured a long while among them. This is demonstrated by that institution of theirs which will not suffer anything to hinder them from having all things in common, so that a rich man enjoys no more of his own wealth than he who hath nothing at all. There are about four thousand men that live in this way, and neither marry wives, nor are desirous to keep servants, as thinking the latter tempts men to be unjust, and the former gives the handle to domestic quarrels. But as they live by themselves, they minister one to another. They also appoint certain stewards to receive the incomes of their revenues, and of the fruits of the ground, such as are good men and priests, who are to get their corn and their food ready for them. They none of them differ from others of the Essenes in their way of living, but do the most resemble those Deke, who are called Poliste, dwellers in cities. But of the fourth sect of Jewish philosophy, Judas the Galilean was the author. These men agree in all other things with the Pharisaic notions, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty, and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. They also do not value dying any kind of death, nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations and friends, nor can any such fear make them call any man lord. And since this immovable resolution of theirs is well known to a great many, I shall speak no farther about that matter, nor am I afraid that anything I have said of them should be disbelieved, but rather fear that what I have said is beneath the resolution they show when they undergo pain. And it was in Gassius Floris' time that the notion began to grow mad with this distemper, who was our procurator, who occasioned the Jews to go wild with it by the abuse of his authority, and to make them revolt from the Romans. And these are the sects of the Jewish philosophy. Chapter 2 How Herod and Philip built several cities in honor of Caesar, concerning the succession of priests and procurators, as also what befell Phraates and the Parthians, When Cyrenius had now disposed of Archelaus's money, and when the taxings were come to a conclusion, which were made in the thirty-seventh year of Caesar's victory over Antony at Actium, he deprived Joazar of the high priesthood, which dignity had been conferred on him by the multitude, and he appointed Ananus, the son of Seth, to be high priest. While Herod and Philip had each of them received their own tetrarchy, and settled the affairs thereof, Herod also built a wall about Sepphoris, which is the security of all Galilee, and made it the metropolis of the country. He also built a wall around Betharanththa, which was itself a city also, and called it Julius, from the name of the emperor's wife. When Philip, also, had built Paneus, a city at the fountains of Jordan, 
He named it Caesarea. He also advanced the village Bethsaida, situate at the lake of Gennesareth, under the dignity of a city, both by the number of inhabitants it contained, and its other grandeur, and called it by the name of Julius, the same name with Caesar's daughter. As Coponius, who we told you was sent along with Cyrenius, was exercising his office of procurator and governing Judea, the following accidents happened. As the Jews were celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we call the Passover, it was customary for the priests to open the temple gates just after midnight. When, therefore, those gates were first opened, some of the Samaritans came privately into Jerusalem and threw about dead men's bodies in the cloisters, on which account the Jews afterward excluded them out of the temple, which they had not used to do at such festivals. And on other accounts also, they watched the temple more carefully than they had formerly done. A little after which incident, Coponius returned to Rome, and Marcus Ambivius came to be his successor in that government, under whom Salome, the sister of King Herod, died, and left to Julia, Caesar's wife, Jamnia, and all its toparchy, and Faisalus in the plain, and Archelaus, where is a great plantation of palm trees, and their fruit is excellent in its king. After him came Aeneas Rufus, under whom died Caesar, the second emperor of Romans, the duration of whose reign was fifty-seven years, besides six months and two days, of which time Antonius ruled together with him fourteen years, but the duration of his life was seventy-seven years, upon whose death Tiberius Nero, his wife Julia's son, succeeded. He was now the third emperor, and he sent Valerius Gratus to be procurator of Judea, and to succeed Aeneas Rufus. This man deprived Aeneas of the high priesthood, and appointed Ishmael, the son of Thabe, to be high priest. He also deprived him in a little time, and ordained Eleazar, the son of Ananus, who had been high priest before, to be high priest. Which office, when he had held for a year, Gratus deprived him of it, and gave the high priesthood to Simon, the son of Camethus. And when he had possessed that dignity no longer than a year, Joseph Caiaphas was made his successor. When Gratus had done those things, he went back to Rome, after he had tarried in Judea eleven years, when Pontius Pilate came as his successor. And now Herod the Tetrarch, who was in great favor with Tiberius, built a city of the same name with him, called it Tiberius. He built it in the best part of Galilee, at the lake of Gennesaret. There are warm baths at a little distance from it, in a village named Emaus. Strangers came and inhabited this city. A great number of the inhabitants were Galileans also and many were necessitated by Herod to come thither out of the country belonging to him, and were by force compelled to be its inhabitants. Some of them were persons of condition. He also admitted poor people, such as those that were collected from all parts, to dwell in it. Nay, some of them were not quite freedmen, and these he was a benefactor to, and made them free in great numbers, but obliged them not to forsake the city, by building them very good houses at his own expenses, and by giving them land also, for he was sensible that to make this place a habitation was to transgress the Jewish ancient laws, because many sepulchres were to be here taken away in order to make room for the city Tiberius, whereas our law pronounces that such inhabitants are unclean for seven days. About this time died Phraates, king of the Parthians, by the treachery of Phraates, his son, upon the occasion following. When Phraates had had legitimate sons of his own, he had also an Italian maidservant, whose name was Thermusa, who had been formerly sent to him by Julius Caesar, among other presents. He first made her his concubine, but he being a great admirer of her beauty, in process of time having a son by her, whose name was Phraedices, he made her his legitimate wife, and had a great respect for her. Now, she was able to persuade him to do anything that she said, and was earnest in procuring the government of Parthia for her son. But still, she saw that her endeavors would not succeed unless she could contrive how to remove Phraates' legitimate sons out of the kingdom. So she persuaded him to send those his sons as pledges of his fidelity to Rome, and they were sent to Rome accordingly, because it was not easy for him to contradict her commands. Now, while Phraates was alone brought up in order to succeed in the government, he thought it very tedious to expect that government by his father's donation as his successor. He therefore formed a treacherous design against his father, by his mother's assistance, with whom, as the report went, he had a criminal conversation also. So he was hated for both these vices, 
while his subjects esteemed this wicked love of his mother to be no way inferior to his parricide, and he was by them, in a sedition, expelled out of the country before he grew too great and died. But, as the best sort of Parthians agreed together that it was impossible they should be governed without a king, while also it was their constant practice to choose one of the family of Arsaces, nor did their law allow of any others, and they thought this kingdom had been sufficiently injured already by the marriage with an Italian concubine, and by her issue, they sent ambassadors, and called Orides to take the crown, for the multitude would not otherwise have borne them. And though he was accused of very great cruelty, and was of an intractable temper, and prone to wrath, yet still was he one of the family of Arsaces. However, they made a conspiracy against him, and slew him, and that, as some say, at a festival, and among their sacrifices, for it is the universal custom there to carry their swords with them. But, as the more general report is, they slew him when they had drawn him out a hunting. So they sent ambassadors to Rome, and desired they would send one of those that were there as pledges to be their king. Accordingly, Vonanes was preferred before the rest, and sent to them, for he seemed capable of such great fortune, which two of the greatest kingdoms under the sun now offered him, his own and a foreign one. However, the barbarians soon changed their minds, they being naturally of immutable disposition, upon the supposal that this man was not worthy to be their governor. For they could not think of obeying the commands of one that had been a slave, for so they called those that had been hostages. Nor could they bear the ignominy of that name, and this was the more intolerable, because then the Parthians must have such a king set over them, not by right of war, but in time of peace. So they presently invited Artabanus, king of Media, to be their king, he being also of the race of Arsaces. Artabanus complied with the other offer that was made him, and came to them with an army. So Vonanes met him, and at first the multitude of the Parthians stood on his side, and he put his army in array. But Artabanus was beaten, and fled to the mountains of Media. Yet did he a little after gather a great army together, and fought with Vonanes, and beat him. Whereupon, Bonanese fled away on horseback, with a few of his attendants about him, to Seleucia, upon Tigris. So when Artabanus had slain a great number, and this, after he had gotten the victory by reason of the very great dismay the barbarians were in, he retired to Tessiphon, with a great number of his people. And so he now reigned over the Parthians. But Vonanese fled away to Armenia, and as soon as he came thither, he had an inclination to have the government of the country given him, and sent ambassadors to Rome for that purpose. But because Tiberius refused it him, and because he wanted courage, and because the Parthian king threatened him, and sent ambassadors to him to denounce war against him if he proceeded, and because he had no way to take to regain any other kingdom, for the people of authority among the Armenians, about Nephates, joined themselves to Artabanus, he delivered up himself to Silenus, the president of Syria, who out of regard to his education at Rome, kept him in Syria, while Artabanus gave Armenia to Orides, one of his own sons. At this time died Antiochus, the king of Commagene, whereupon the multitude contended with the nobility, and both sent ambassadors to Rome, for the men of power were desirous that their form of government might be changed into that of a Roman province, as were the multitude desirous to be under kings, as their fathers had been. So the senate made a decree that Germanicus should be sent to settle the affairs of the east, fortune hereby taking a proper opportunity for depriving him of his life. For when he had been in the east and settled all the affairs there, his life was taken away by the poison which Piso gave him, as hath been related elsewhere. Chapter 3 Sedition of the Jews against Pontius Pilate concerning Christ and what befell Paulina and the Jews at home. But now Pilate the procurator of Judea removed the army from Caesarea to Jerusalem to take their winter quarters there in order to abolish the Jewish laws. So he introduced Caesar's effigies, which were upon the ensigns, and brought them into the city, whereas our law forbids us the very making of images, on which account the former procurators were wont to make their entry into the city with such ensigns as had not those ornaments. Pilate was the first who brought those images to Jerusalem and set them up there, which was done without the knowledge of the people, because it was done in the night time. But as soon as they knew it, they came in multitudes to Caesarea, and interceded with Pilate many days that he would remove the images. And when he would not grant their requests, 
because it would tend to the injury of Caesar, while yet they persevered in their request. On the sixth day, he ordered his soldiers to have their weapons privately, while he came and sat upon his judgment seat, which seat was so prepared in the open place of the city that it concealed the army that lay ready to oppress them. And when the Jews petitioned him again, he gave a signal to the soldiers to encompass them around, and threatened that their punishment should be no less than immediate death unless they would leave off disturbing him and go their ways home. But they threw themselves upon the ground and laid their necks bare and said they would take their death very willingly rather than the wisdom of their laws should be transgressed, upon which Pilate was deeply affected with their firm resolution to keep their laws inviolable and presently commanded the images to be carried back from Jerusalem to Caesarea. But Pilate undertook to bring a current of water to Jerusalem and did it with the sacred money, and derived the origin of the stream from the distance of two hundred furlongs. However, the Jews were not pleased with what had been done about this water, and many ten thousands of the people got together, and made a clamor against him, and insisted that he should leave off that design. Some of them also used reproaches, and abused the man, as crowds of such people usually do. So he habited a great number of his soldiers in their habit, who carried daggers under their garments, and sent them to a place where they might surround them. So he bade the Jews himself go away, but they, boldly casting reproaches upon him, he gave the soldiers that signal which had been beforehand agreed on, who laid upon them much greater blows than Pilate had commanded them, and equally punished those that were tumultuous, and those that were not, nor did they spare them in the least. And since the people were unarmed, and were caught by men prepared for what they were about, there were a great number of them slain by this means, and others of them ran away wounded, and thus an end was put to this sedition. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. About the same time also, another sad calamity put the Jews into disorder, and certain shameful practices happened about the temple of Isis that was at Rome. I will now first take notice of the wicked attempt about the temple of Isis, and will then give an account of the Jewish affairs. There was at Rome a woman whose name was Paulina, one who on account of the dignity of her ancestors, and by the regular conduct of a virtuous life, had a great reputation. She was also very rich, and although she was of a beautiful countenance, and in that flower of her age wherein women are the most gay, yet did she lead a life of great modesty. She was married to Saturninus, one that was every way answerable to her in an excellent character. Decius Mundus fell in love with this woman, who was a man very high in the equestrian order, and as she was of too great dignity to be caught by presents, and had already rejected them, though they had been sent in great abundance, he was still more inflamed with love to her, insomuch that he promised to give her two hundred thousand attic drachmae for one night's lodging. And when this would not prevail upon her, and he was not able to bear this misfortune in his armors, he thought it the best way to famish himself to death for want of food on account of Paulina's sad refusal. And he determined with himself to die after such a manner, and he went on with his purpose accordingly. Now, Mundus had a freedwoman who had been made free by his father, whose name was Ide, one skillful in all sorts of mischief. This woman was very much grieved at the young man's resolution to kill himself, for he did not conceal his intentions to destroy himself from others, and came to him and encouraged him by her discourse, and made him to hope, by some promises she gave him, that he might obtain a night's lodging with Paulina. And when he joyfully hearkened to her entreaty, she said she wanted no more than fifty thousand drachmae for the entrapping of the woman. So when she had encouraged the young man, and gotten as much money as she required, she did not take the same methods it had been taken before, because she perceived that the woman was by no means to be tempted by money. But as she knew that she was very much given to the worship of the goddess Isis, she devised the following stratagem. She went to some of Isis's priests, and upon the strongest assurance of concealment, she persuaded them by words, but chiefly by the offer of money, of twenty-five thousand drachmae in hand, and as much more when the thing had taken effect, and told them the passion of the young man, 
and persuaded them to use all means possible to beguile the woman. So they were drawn in to promise so to do by that large sum of gold they were to have. Accordingly, the oldest of them went immediately to Paulina, and upon his admittance, he desired to speak with that he was sent by the god Anubis, who was fallen in love with her, and enjoined her to come to him. Upon this, she took the message very kindly, and valued herself greatly upon this condescension of Anubis, and told her husband that she had a message sent her, and was to sup and lie with Anubis. So he agreed to her acceptance of the offer, as fully satisfied with the chastity of his wife. Accordingly, she went to the temple, and after she had supped there, and it was the hour to go to sleep, the priest shut the doors of the temple, when in the holy part of it, the lights were also put out. Then did Mundus leap out, for he was hidden therein, and did not fail of enjoying her, who was at his service all night long, as supposing he was the god. And when he was gone away, which was before those priests who knew nothing of this stratagem were stirring, Paulina came early to her husband, and told him how the god Anubis had appeared to her. Among her friends also, she declared how great a value she put upon this favor, who partly disbelieved the thing when they reflected on its nature, and partly were amazed at it, as having no pretense for not believing it, when they considered the modesty and the dignity of the person. But now, on the third day after what had been done, Mundus met Paulina and said, Nay, Paulina, thou hast saved me two hundred thousand drachmae, which sum thou mightest have added to thy own family. Yet hast thou not failed to be at my service in the manner I invited thee. As for the reproaches thou hast laid upon Mundus, I value not the business of names, but I rejoice in the pleasure I reaped by what I did, while I took to myself the name of Anubis. When he had said this, he went his way, but now she began to come to the sense of the grossness of what she had done, and rent her garments, and told her husband of the horrid nature of this wicked contrivance, and prayed him not to neglect to assist her in this case. So he discovered the fact to the emperor, whereupon Tiberius inquired into the matter thoroughly by examining the priests about it, and ordered them to be crucified, as well as Ide, who was the occasion of their perdition, and who had contrived the whole matter which was so injurious to the woman. He also demolished the temple of Isis, and gave order that her statue should be thrown into the river Tiber, while he only banished Mundus, but did no more to him, because he supposed that what crime he had committed was done out of the passion of love, and these were the circumstances which concerned the temple of Isis and the injuries occasioned by her priests. I now return to the relation of what happened about this time to the Jews at Rome, as I formerly told you I would. There was a man who was a Jew, but had been driven away from his own country by an accusation laid against him for transgressing their laws, and by the fear he was under of punishment for the same. But in all respects, a wicked man, he then living at Rome, professed to instruct men in the wisdom of the laws of Moses. He procured also three other men, entirely of the same character with himself, to be his partners. These men persuaded Fulvia, a woman of great dignity, and one that had embraced the Jewish religion, to send purple and gold to the temple at Jerusalem. And, when they had gotten them, they employed them for their own uses, and spent the money themselves, on which account it was that they had first required it of her. Whereupon Tiberius, who had been informed of the thing by Saturninus, the husband of Fulvia, who desired inquiry might be made about it, ordered all the Jews to be banished out of Rome, at which time the consuls listed four thousand men out of them, and sent them to the island Sardinia, but punished a greater number of them, who were unwilling to become soldiers on account of keeping the laws of their forefathers. Thus were these Jews banished out of the city by the wickedness of four men. Chapter 4 how the Samaritans made a tumult, and Pilate destroyed many of them. How Pilate was accused, and what things were done by Vitellius relating to the Jews and the Parthians. But the nation of the Samaritans did not escape without tumults. The man who excited them to it was one who thought lying a thing of little consequence, and who contrived everything so that the multitude might be pleased. So he bade them get together upon Mount Gerizim, which is by them looked upon as the most holy of all mountains, and assured them that, when they were come thither, he would show them those sacred vessels which were laid under that place, because Moses put them there. So they came thither armed, and thought the discourse of the man probable. And as they abode at a certain village, which was called Tirathaba, they got the rest together to them, and desired to go up the mountain in a great multitude together. 
but Pilate prevented their going up by seizing upon the roads with a great band of horsemen and footmen who fell upon those that were gotten together in the village. And when they came to an action, some of them they slew, and others of them they put to flight and took a great many alive, the principal of whom, and also the most potent of those that fled away, Pilate ordered to be slain. But when this tumult was appeased, the Samaritan Senate sent an embassy to Vitellius, a man that had been consul, and who was now president of Syria, and accused Pilate of the murder of those that were killed, for that they did not go to Tyrathaba in order to revolt from the Romans, but to escape the violence of Pilate. So Vitellius sent Marcellus, a friend of his, to take care of the affairs of Judea, and ordered Pilate to go to Rome to answer before the emperor to the accusation of the Jews. So Pilate, when he had tarried ten years in Judea, made haste to Rome, and this in obedience to the orders of Vitellius, which he durst not contradict. But before he could get to Rome, Tiberius was dead. But Vitellius came into Judea and went up to Jerusalem. It was at the time of that festival which is called Passover. Vitellius was there magnificently received and released the inhabitants of Jerusalem from all the taxes upon the fruits that were bought and sold and gave them leave to have the care of the high priest's vestments with all their ornaments and to have them under the custody of the priests in the temple, which power they used to have formerly. Although at this time they were laid up in the tower of Antonia, the citadel so called, and that on the occasion following, there was one of the high priests named Hyrcanus, and as there were many of that name, he was the first of them. This man built a tower near the temple, and when he had so done, he generally dwelt in it, and had these vestments with him, because it was lawful for him alone to put them on, and he had them there reposited when he went down into the city and took his ordinary garments. The same things were continued to be done by his sons, and by their sons after them. But when Herod came to be king, he rebuilt this tower, which was very conveniently situated in a magnificent manner. And because he was a friend to Antonius, he called it by the name of Antonia. And as he found these vestments lying there, he retained them in the same place, as believing that, while he had them in his custody, the people would make no innovations against him. The like to what Herod did was done by his son Archelaus, who was made king after him, after whom the Romans, when they entered on the government, took possession of these vestments of the high priest and had them reposited in a stone chamber under the seal of the priests and of the keepers of the temple, the captain of the guard lighting a lamp there every day, and seven days before a festival, they were delivered to them by the captain of the guards, when the high priest having purified them and made use of them, laid them up again in the same chamber where they had been laid up before, and this the very next day after the festival was over. This was the practice at the three yearly festivals and on the fast day, but Vitellius put those garments into our own power, as in the days of our forefathers, and ordered the captain of the guard not to trouble himself to inquire where they were laid, or when they were to be used, and this he did as an act of kindness, to oblige the nation to him. Besides which, he also deprived Joseph, who was called Caiaphas, of the high priesthood, and appointed Jonathan, the son of Ananus, the former high priest, to succeed him. After which he took his journey back to Antioch. Moreover, Tiberius sent a letter to Vitellius and commanded him to make a league of friendship with Artabanus, the king of Parthia, for while he was his enemy, he terrified him, because he had taken Armenia away from him, lest he should proceed farther, and told him he should no otherwise trust him than upon his giving him hostages, and especially his son Artabanus. Upon Tiberius' writing thus to Vitellius, by the offer of great presents of money, he persuaded both the king of Iberia and the king of Albania to make no delay but to fight against Artabanus. And although they would not do it themselves, yet did they give the Scythians a passage through their country, and opened the Caspian gates to them, and brought them upon Artabanus. So Armenia was again taken from the Parthians, and the country of Parthia was filled with war, and the principal of their men were slain, and all things were in disorder among them. The king's son also himself fell in these wars together with many ten thousands of his army, Vitellius had also sent such great sums of money to Artabanus' father's kinsmen and friends that he had almost procured him to be slain by the means of those bribes which they had taken. And when Artabanus perceived that the plot laid against him was not to be avoided, because it was laid by the principal men, and those a great many in number, and that it would certainly take effect when he had estimated the number of those that were truly faithful to him, as also of those who were already corrupted, 
but were deceitful in the kindness they professed to him, and were likely, upon trial, to go over to his enemies. He made his escape to the upper provinces, where he afterwards raised a great army out of the Dehe and Seike, and fought with his enemies, and retained his principality. When Tiberius had heard of these things, he desired to have a league of friendship made between him and Artabanus, and when, upon this invitation, he received the proposal kindly, Artabanus and Vitellius went to Euphrates, and as a bridge was laid over the river, they each of them came with their guards about them, and met one another on the midst of the bridge. And when they had agreed upon the terms of peace, Herod the Tetrarch erected a rich tent on the midst of the passage, and made them a feast there. Artabanus also, not long afterwards, sent his son Darius as an hostage, with many presents, among which there was a man seven cubits tall, a Jew he was by birth, and his name was Eleazar, who, for his tallness, was called a giant. After which Vitellius went to Antioch, and Artabanus to Babylon. But Herod the Tetrarch, being desirous to give Caesar the first information that they had obtained hostages, sent posts with letters, wherein he had accurately described all the particulars, and had left nothing for the consular Vitellius to inform him of. But when Vitellius's letters were sent, and Caesar had let him know that he was acquainted with the affairs already, because Herod had given him an account of them before, Vitellius was very much troubled at it, and supposing that he had been thereby a greater sufferer than he really was, he kept up a secret anger upon this occasion, till he could be revenged on him, which he was after Caius had taken the government. About this time it was that Philip, Herod's brother, departed this life, in the twentieth year of the reign of Tiberius, after he had been tetrarch of Trachonitis and Golanitis, and of the nation of the Batanians also, thirty-seven years, he had shown himself a person of moderation and quietness in the conduct of his life and government. He constantly lived in that country which was subject to him. He used to make his progress with a few chosen friends. His tribunal also, on which he sat in judgment, followed him in his progress. And when anyone met him who wanted his assistance, he made no delay but had his tribunal set down immediately, wheresoever he happened to be, and sat down upon it, and heard his complaint. He there ordered the guilty that were convicted to be punished, and absolved those that had been accused unjustly. He died at Julius, and when he was carried to that monument, which he had already erected for himself beforehand, he was buried with great pomp. His principality Tiberius took, for he left no sons behind him, and added it to the province of Syria, but gave order that the tributes which arose from it should be collected and laid up in his tetrarchy. Chapter 5 Herod the Tetrarch makes war with Aretas, the king of Arabia, and is beaten by him, as also concerning the death of John the Baptist. How Vitellius went up to Jerusalem, together with some account of Agrippa and of the posterity of Herod the Great. About this time Aretas, the king of Arabia Petria, and Herod had a quarrel on the account following. Herod the Tetrarch had married the daughter of Aretas, and had lived with her a great while. But when he was once at Rome, he lodged with Herod, who was his brother indeed, but not by the same mother, for his Herod was the son of the high priest Simon's daughter. However, he fell in love with Herodias, this last Herod's wife, who was the daughter of Aristobulus their brother, and the sister of Agrippa the Great. This man ventured to talk to her about a marriage between them, which address when she admitted an agreement was made for her to change her habitation and to come to him as soon as she should return from Rome. One article of this marriage also was this, that he should divorce Aretas' daughter. So Antipas, when he had made this agreement, sailed to Rome. But when he had done there the business he went about and was returned again, his wife having discovered the agreement he had made with Herodias, and having learned it before he had notice of her knowledge of the whole design, she desired him to send her to Machaerus, which is a place on the borders of the dominions of Aretas and Herod, without informing him of any of her intentions. Accordingly, Herod sent her thither, as thinking his wife had not perceived anything. Now she had sent a good while before to Machaerus, which was a subject to her father, and so all things necessary for her journey were made ready for her by the general of Aretas' army, and by that means she soon came into Arabia, under the conduct of several generals, who carried her from one to another successively and she soon came to her father, and told him of Herod's intentions. So Aretas made the first occasion of his enmity between him and Herod, 
who had also some quarrel with him about their limits at the country of Gamalitis. So they raised armies on both sides, and prepared for war, and sent their generals to fight instead of themselves. And when they had joined battle, all Herod's army was destroyed by the treachery of some fugitives, who, though they were of the Tetrarchy of Philip, joined with Eretus's army. So Herod wrote about these affairs to Tiberius, who, being very angry at the attempt made by Eretus, wrote to Vitellius to make war upon him, and either to take him alive, and bring him to him in bonds, or to kill him, and send him his head. This was the charge that Tiberius gave to the president of Syria. Now, some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very justly as a punishment of what he did against John that was called the Baptist. For Herod slew him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as to righteousness towards one another, and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism, for that the washing with water would be acceptable to him if they made use of it, not in order to the putting away or the remission of some sins only, but for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified beforehand by righteousness. Now, when many others came in crowds about him, for they were greatly moved or pleased by hearing his words, Herod, who feared lest the great influence John had over the people, might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, for they seemed ready to do anything he should advise, thought it best by putting him to death to prevent any mischief he might cause, and not bring himself into difficulties by sparing a man who might make him repent of it when it should be too late. Accordingly, he was sent a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Macarus, the castle I before mentioned, and was there put to death. Now the Jews had an opinion that the destruction of this army was sent as a punishment upon Herod, and a mark of God's displeasure against him. So Vitellius prepared to make war with Eretus, having with him two legions of armed men. He also took with him all those of light armature, and of the horsemen which belonged to them, and were drawn out of those kingdoms which were under the Romans, and made haste for Petra, and came to Ptolemaeus. But as he was marching very busily, and leading his army through Judea, the principal men met him, and desired that he would not thus march through their land, for that the laws of their country would not permit them to overlook those images which were brought into it, of which there were a great many in their ensigns. So he was persuaded by what they said, and changed that resolution of his, which he had before taken in this matter. Whereupon he ordered the army to march along the great plain, while he himself, with Herod the Tetrarch, and his friends, went up to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice to God, an ancient festival of the Jews being then just approaching. And when he had been there, and been honorably entertained by the multitude of the Jews, he made a stay there for three days, within which time he deprived Jonathan of the high priesthood, and gave it to his brother Theophilus. But when on the fourth day letters came to him which informed him of the death of Tiberius, he obliged the multitude to take an oath of fidelity to Caius. He also recalled his army, and made them every one go home, and take their winter quarters there, since, upon the devolution of the empire upon Caius, he had not the like authority of making this war which he had before. It was also reported that when Eretus heard of the coming of Vitellius to fight him, he said upon his consulting the diviners that it was impossible that this army of Vitellius could enter Petra, for that one of the rulers would die, either he that gave orders for the war, or he that was marching at the other's desire, in order to be subservient to his will, or else he against whom this army is prepared. So Vitellius truly retired to Antioch, but Agrippa, the son of Aristobulus, went up to Rome a year before the death of Tiberius in order to treat of some affairs with the emperor, if he might be permitted so to do. I have now a mind to describe Herod and his family, how it fared with them, partly because it is suitable to this history to speak of that matter, and partly because this thing is a demonstration of the interposition of providence, how a multitude of children is of no advantage, no more than any other strength that mankind set their hearts upon, besides those acts of piety which are done towards God. For it happened that within the revolution of a hundred years, the posterity of Herod, who were a great many in number, were, excepting a few, utterly destroyed. One may well apply this for the instruction of mankind, and learn thence how unhappy they were. It will also show us the history of Agrippa, who, as he was a person most worthy of admiration, so was he from a private man, beyond all the expectation of those that knew him, advanced to great power and authority. I have said something of them formerly, but I shall now also speak accurately about them.
Herod the Great had two daughters by Mariamne, the granddaughter of Hyrcanus. The one was Salamcio, who was married to Phasilus, her first cousin, who was himself the son of Phasilus, Herod's brother, her father making the match. The other was Cyprus, who was herself also married to her first cousin Antipater, the son of Salome, Herod's sister. Phasilus had five children by Salamcio, Antipater, Herod, and Alexander, and two daughters, Alexandra and Cyprus, which last Agrippa, the son of Aristobulus, married, and Timius of Cyprus married Alexandra. He was a man of note, but had by her no children. Agrippa had by Cyprus two sons and three daughters, which daughters were named Bernice, Mariamne, and Drusilla. But the names of the sons were Agrippa and Drusus, of which Drusus died before he came to the years of puberty. But their father, Agrippa, was brought up with his older brethren, Herod and Aristobulus, for these were also the sons of Herod the Great by Bernice. But Bernice was the daughter of Costobarus and of Salome, who was Herod's sister. Aristobulus left these infants when he was slain by his father, together with his brother Alexander, as we have related. But when they were arrived at the years of puberty, this Herod, the brother of Agrippa, married Mariamne, the daughter of Olympias, who was the daughter of Herod the king and of Joseph, the son of Joseph, who was brother to Herod the king, and had by her a son, Aristobulus. But Aristobulus, the third brother of Agrippa, married Jotope, the daughter of Samsagerimus, king of Emesa. They had a daughter who was deaf, whose name also was Jotope, and these hitherto were the children of the male line. But Herodias, their sister, was married to Herod Philip, the son of Herod the Great, who was born of Mariamne, the daughter of Simon the high priest, who had a daughter, Salome, after whose birth Herodias took upon her to confound the laws of our country and divorce herself from her husband while he was alive and was married to Herod, Antipas, her husband's brother, by the father's side. He was tetrarch of Galilee. But her daughter, Salome, was married to Philip, the son of Herod and tetrarch of Trachonitis. And, as he died childless, Aristobulus, the son of Herod, the brother of Agrippa, married her. They had three sons, Herod, Agrippa, and Aristobulus. And this was the posterity of Phasilus and Salampsio. But the daughter of Antipater by Cyprus was Cyprus, whom Alexis Celsius, the son of Alexis, married. They had a daughter, Cyprus. But Herod and Alexander, who, as we have told you, were the brothers of Antipater, died childless. As to Alexander, the son of Herod the king, who was slain by his father, he had two sons, Alexander and Tigranes, by the daughter of Archelaus, king of Cappadocia. Tigranes, who was king of Armenia, was accused at Rome and died childless. Alexander had a son of the same name with his brother Tigranes and was sent to take possession of the kingdom of Armenia by Nero. He had a son, Alexander, who married Jotope, the daughter of Antiochus, the king of Comagene. Vespasian made him king of an island in Sicilia, but these descendants of Alexander, soon after their birth, deserted the Jewish religion and went over to that of the Greeks, but for the rest of the daughters of Herod the king, it happened that they died childless. And as these descendants of Herod, whom we have enumerated, were in being at the same time that Agrippa the Great took the kingdom, and I have now given an account of them, it now remains that I relate the several hard fortunes which befell Agrippa, and how he got clear of them, and was advanced to the greatest height of dignity and power. Chapter 6 of the navigation of King Agrippa to Rome, to Tiberius Caesar, and how, upon his being accused by his own freedmen, he was bound, how also he was set at liberty by Caius after Tiberius' death and was made king of the Tetrarchy of Philip. A little before the death of Herod the king, Agrippa lived at Rome and was generally brought up and conversed with Drusus the emperor Tiberius' son and contracted a friendship with Antonia, the wife of Drusus the Great, who had his mother Bernice in great esteem, and was very desirous of advancing her son. Now, as Agrippa was by nature magnanimous and generous in the presence he made while his mother was alive, this inclination of his mind did not appear that he might be able to avoid her anger for such his extravagance. But when Bernice was dead, and he was left to his own conduct, he spent a great deal extravagantly in his daily way of living, and a great deal in the immoderate presents he made, and those chiefly among Caesar's freedmen, in order to gain their assistance, 
insomuch that he was in a little time reduced to poverty and could not live at Rome any longer. Tiberius also forbade the friends of his deceased son to come into his sight, because on seeing them he should be put in his mind of his son, and his grief would thereby be revived. For these reasons he went away from Rome and sailed to Judea, but in evil circumstances, being dejected with the loss of that money which he once had, and because he had not wherewithal to pay his creditors, who were many in number, and such as gave no room for escaping them. Whereupon he knew not what to do, so for shame of his present condition, he retired to a certain tower at Malatha in Idumea, and had thoughts of killing himself. But his wife Cyprus perceived his intentions, and tried all sorts of methods to divert him from his taking such a course. So she sent a letter to his sister Herodias, who was now the wife of Hera the Tetrarch, and let her know Agrippa's present design, and what necessity it was that drove him thereto, and desired her, as a kinswoman of his, to give him her help, and to engage her husband to do the same, since she saw how she alleviated these her husband's troubles all she could, although she had not the like wealth to do it withal. So they sent for him, and allotted him Tiberius for his habitation, and appointed him some income of money for his maintenance, and made him a magistrate of that city, by way of honor to him. Yet did not Herod long continue in that resolution of supporting him, though even that support was not sufficient for him, for, as once they were at a feast at Tyre, and in their cups, and reproaches were cast upon one another, Agrippa thought that was not to be borne, while Herod hit him in the teeth with his poverty, and with his owing his necessary food to him. So he went to Flaccus, one that had been consul, and had been a very great friend to him at Rome formerly, and was now president of Syria. Hereupon, Flaccus received him kindly, and he lived with him. Flaccus had also with him there Astabulus, who was indeed Agrippa's brother, but was at variance with him. Yet did not their enmity to one another hinder the friendship of Flaccus to them both, but still they were honorably treated by him. However, Aristobulus did not abate of his ill will to Agrippa, till at length he brought him into ill terms with Flaccus, the occasion of bringing on which estrangement was this. The Damasins were at difference with the Sidonians about their limits, and when Flaccus was about to hear the cause between them, they understood that Agrippa had a mighty influence upon him, so they desired that he would be of their side, and for that favor promised him a great deal of money. So he was zealous in assisting the Damasins as far as he was able. Now, Aristobulus had gotten intelligence of this promise of money to him, and accused him to Flaccus of the same. And when, upon a thorough examination of the matter, it appeared plainly so to be, he rejected Agrippa out of the number of his friends. So he was reduced to the utmost necessity, and came to Ptolemaeus, and because he knew not where else to get a livelihood, he thought to sail to Italy. But as he was restrained from doing so by want of money, he desired Marcius, who was his freedman, to find some method for procuring him so much as he wanted for that purpose, by borrowing such a sum of some person or other. So Marcius desired of Peter, who was the freedman of Bernice, Agrippa's mother, and by the right of her testament was bequeathed to Antonia to lend so much upon Agrippa's own bond and security but he accused Agrippa of having defrauded him of certain sums of money, and so obliged Marcius, when he made the bond of twenty thousand added drachmae, to accept of twenty-five hundred drachmae, less than what he desired, which the other allowed of, because he could not help it. Upon the receipt of this money, Agrippa came to Anthedon, and took shipping, and was going to set sail. But Herennius Capito, who was the procurator of Jamnia, sent a band of soldiers to demand of him three hundred thousand drachmae of silver, which were by him owing to Caesar's treasury while he was at Rome, and so forced him to stay. He then pretended that he would do as he bade him, but when night came on, he cut his cables and went off, and sailed to Alexandria, where he desired Alexander the Alabarch to lend him two hundred thousand drachmae, but he said he would not lend it to him, but would not refuse it to Cyprus, as greatly astonished at her affection to her husband, and at the other instances of her virtue. So she undertook to repay it, Accordingly, Alexander paid them five talents at Alexandria, and promised to pay them the rest of that sum at Dysarchia, Puteoli, and this he did out of the fear he was in that Agrippa would soon spend it. So this Cyprus set her husband free, and dismissed him to go on with his navigation to Italy, while she and children departed for Judea. And now Agrippa was come to Puteoli, whence he wrote a letter to Tiberius Caesar, who then lived at Capriae, and told him that he was come so far in order to wait on him and to pay him a visit. 
and desired that he would give him leave to come over to Caprier. So Tiberius made no difficulty, but wrote to him in an obliging way in other respects, and withal told him he was glad of his safe return, and desired him to come to Caprier. And, when he was come, he did not fail to treat him as kindly as he had promised him in his letter to do. But the next day came a letter to Caesar from Herennius Capito, to inform him that Agrippa had borrowed 300,000 drachmae, and not paid it at the time appointed. But, when it was demanded of him, he ran away like a fugitive, out of the places under his government, and put it out of his power to get the money of him. When Caesar had read this letter, he was much troubled at it, and gave order that Agrippa should be excluded from his presence until he had paid that debt, upon which he was in no way daunted at Caesar's anger, but entreated Antonia, the mother of Germanicus, and of Claudius, who was afterwards Caesar himself, to lend him those three hundred thousand drachmae, that he might not be deprived of Tiberius's friendship. So, out of regard to the memory of Bernice, his mother, for those two women were very familiar with one another, and out of regard of his and Claudius's education together, she lent him the money, and, upon the payment of his debt, there was nothing to hinder Tiberius's friendship to him. After this, Tiberius Caesar recommended to him his grandson, and ordered that he should always accompany him when he went abroad. But, upon Agrippa's kind reception by Antonia, he betook him to pay his respects to Caius, who was her grandson, and in very high reputation by reason of the good will they bore his father. Now there was one Thallus, a freedman of Caesar, of whom he borrowed a million of drachmae, and thence repaid Antonia the debt he owed her, and by sending the overplus and paying his court to Caius, became a person of great authority with him. Now as the friendship which Agrippa had for Caius was come to a great height, there happened some words to pass between them, as they once were in a chariot together concerning Tiberius. Agrippa paying to God, for they two sat by themselves, that Tiberius might soon go off the stage and leave the government to Caius, who was in every respect more worthy of it. Now, Eutychus, who was Agrippa's freedman, and drove his chariot, heard these words, and at that time said nothing of them. But when Agrippa accused him of stealing some garments of his, which was certainly true, he ran away from him. But when he was caught and brought before Piso, who was the governor of the city, and the man was asked why he ran away, he replied that he had somewhat to say to Caesar that tended to his security and preservation. So Piso bound him and sent him to Caprie. But Tiberius, according to his usual custom, kept him still in bonds, being a delayer of affairs, if ever there was any other king or tyrant that was so. For he did not admit ambassadors quickly, and no successors were dispatched away to governors or procurators of the provinces that had formerly been sent, unless they were dead, whence it was that he was so negligent in hearing the causes of prisoners, insomuch that when he was asked by his friends what was the reason of his delay in such cases, he said that he delayed to hear ambassadors, lest upon their quick dismission other ambassadors should be appointed and return upon him and so he should bring trouble upon himself in their public reception and dismission, that he permitted those governors who had been sent once to their governments to stay there a great while out of regard to the subjects that were under them, for that all governors are naturally disposed to get as much as they can, and that those who are not to fix there but to stay a short time, and that, at an uncertainty when they shall be turned out, do the more severely hurry themselves on to fleece the people, but that, if their government be long continued to them, they are at last satiated with the spoils, as having gotten a vast deal, and so become at length less sharp in their pillaging. But that, if successors are sent quickly, the poor subjects, who are exposed to them as a prey, will not be able to bear the new ones, while they shall not have the same time allowed them wherein their predecessors have filled themselves, and so grow more unconcerned about getting more, and this because they are removed before they have had time for their oppressions. He gave them an example to show his meaning. A great number of flies came about the sore places of a man that had been wounded, upon which one of the standers by pitied the man's misfortune, and thinking he was not able to drive away those flies himself, he was going to drive them away for him, but he prayed him to let them alone. The other, by way of reply, asked him the reason of such a preposterous proceeding in preventing relief from his present misery, to which he answered, If thou drivest these flies away, thou wilt hurt me worse. For as these are already full of my blood, they do not crowd about me, nor pain me so much as before, but are sometimes more remiss, while the fresh ones that come, almost famished, and find me quite tired down already, will be my destruction. For this cause, therefore, 
it is that I am myself careful not to send such new governors perpetually to those my subjects, who are already sufficiently harassed by many oppressions, as may, like these flies, farther distress them, and so, besides their natural desire of gain, may have this additional incitement to it, that they expect to be suddenly deprived of that pleasure which they take in it. And, as a farther attestation to what I say of the dilatory nature of Tiberius, I appeal to this, his practice itself. For although he was emperor twenty-two years, he sent in all but two procurators to govern the nation of the Jews, Gratus and his successor in the government, Pilate. Nor was he in one way of acting with respect to the Jews, and in another, with respect to the rest of his subjects. He further informed them, that even in the hearing of the causes of prisoners, he made such delays, because immediate death to those that must be condemned to die would be an alleviation of their present miseries, while those wicked wretches have not deserved any favor. But I do it, that by being harassed with the present calamity, they may undergo greater misery. On this account it was, that Eutychus could not obtain a hearing, but was kept still in prison. However, some time afterwards, Tiberius came from Capriae to Tusculanum, which is about a hundred furlongs from Rome. Agrippa then desired of Antonia that she would procure a hearing for Eutychus, let the matter whereof he accused him prove that it would. Now, Antonia was greatly esteemed by Tiberius on all accounts, from the dignity of her relation to him, who had been his brother Drusus's wife, and from all her eminent charity. For though she was still a young woman, she continued in her widowhood, and refused all other matches, although Augustus had enjoined her to be married to somebody else, yet did she all along preserve her reputation free from reproach. She had also been the greatest benefactress to Tiberius, when there was a very dangerous plot laid against him by Seginus, a man who had been her husband's friend, and who had the greatest authority, because he was general of the army, and when many members of the senate, and many of the freedmen joined with him, and the soldiery was corrupted, and the plot was come to a great height. Now Seginus had certainly gained his point, had not Antonia's boldness been more wisely conducted than Seginus's malice. For, when she had discovered his designs against Tiberius, she wrote him an exact account of the whole, and gave the letter to Pallas, the most faithful of her servants, and sent him to Capria to Tiberius, who, when he understood it, slew Seginus and his confederates. So that Tiberius, who had her in great esteem before, now looked upon her with still greater respect, and depended upon her in all things. So, when Tiberius was desired by this Antonia to examine Eutychus, he answered, If indeed Eutychus hath falsely accused Agrippa in what he hath said of him, he hath had sufficient punishment by what I have done to him already. But if, upon examination, the accusation appears to be true, let Agrippa have a care, lest, out of desire of punishing his freedmen, he do not rather bring a punishment upon himself. Now, when Antonia told Agrippa of this, he was still much more pressing that the matter might be examined into. So Antonia, upon Agrippa's lying hard at her continually to beg this favor, took the following opportunity. As Tiberius lay once at his ease upon his sedan, and was carried about, and Caius, her grandson, and Agrippa were before him after dinner, she walked by the sedan, and desired him to call Eutychus, and have him examined. To which he replied, O Antonia, the gods are my witnesses, that I am induced to do what I am going to do, not by my own inclination, but because I am forced to it by thy prayers. When he had said this, he ordered Macro, who succeeded Seginus, to bring Eutychus to him. Accordingly, without any delay, he was brought. Then Tiberius asked him what he had to say against a man who had given him his liberty. Upon which he said, O my lord, this Caius and Agrippa with him were once riding in a chariot when I sat at their feet, and, among other discourses that passed, Agrippa said to Caius, O oh, that the day would once come when this old fellow will die, and name thee for the governor of the habitable earth. For then this Tiberius, his grandson, would be no hindrance, but would be taken off by thee, and that earth would be happy, and I happy also. Now, Tiberius took these to be truly Agrippa's words, and bearing a grudge withal at Agrippa, because, when he had commanded him to pay his respects to Tiberius, his grandson, and the son of Drusus, Tiberius had not paid him that respect, but had disobeyed his commands, and transferred all his regard to Caius. He said to Macro, Bind this man. But Macro, not distinctly knowing which of them it was whom he bade him bind, and not expecting that he would have any such thing done to Agrippa, he forbore, and came to ask more distinctly what it was that he said. 
But when Caesar had gone round the Hippodrome, he found Agrippa standing. For certain, said he, Macro, this is the man I meant to have bound. And when he still asked which of these is to be bound, he said, Agrippa. Upon which Agrippa betook himself to make supplication for himself, putting him in mind of his son, with whom he was brought up, and of Tiberius, his grandson, whom he had educated, but all to no purpose, for they led him about bound even in his purple garments. It was also very hot weather, and they had but little wine to their meal, so that he was very thirsty. He was also in a sort of agony, and took this treatment of him heinously, as he therefore saw one of Caius's slaves, whose name was Tomastus, carrying some water in a vessel. He desired that he would let him drink. So the servant gave him some water to drink, and he drank heartily, and said, O thou boy, this service of thine to me will be for thy advantage, for, if I once get clear of these my bonds, I will soon procure thee thy freedom from Caius, who has not been wanting to minister to me now I am in bonds, in the same manner as when I was in my former state and dignity. Nor did he deceive him in what he promised him, but made him amends for what he had now done. For, when afterward Agrippa was come to the kingdom, he took particular care of Tomastus, and got him his liberty from Caius, and made him the steward over his own estate. And when he died, he left him to Agrippa his son, and to Bernice his daughter, to minister to them in the same capacity. The man also grew old in that honorable post, and therein died, but all this happened a good while later. Now Agrippa stood in his bonds before the royal palace, and leaned on a certain tree for grief, with many others, who were in bonds also. And as a certain bird sat upon the tree on which Agrippa leaned, the Romans called this bird, Bubo, an owl. One of those that were bound, a German by nation, saw him, and asked a soldier who that man in purple was. And when he was informed that his name was Agrippa, and that he was by nation a Jew, and one of the principal men of that nation, he asked leave of the soldier to whom he was bound, to let him come near to him, to speak with him, for that he had a mind to inquire of him about some things relating to his country. Which liberty, when he had obtained, as he stood near him, he said thus to him by an interpreter, This sudden change of thy condition, O young man, is grievous to thee, as bringing on thee a manifold and very great adversity. Nor wilt thou believe me, when I foretell how thou wilt get clear of this misery which thou art now under, and how divine providence will provide for thee. Know therefore, and I appeal to my own country gods, as well as to the gods of this place, who have awarded these bonds to us, that all I am going to say about thy concerns shall neither be said for favor nor bribery, nor out of an endeavor to make thee cheerful without cause. For such predictions, when they come to fail, make the grief at last, and in earnest, more bitter than if the party had never heard of such a thing. However, though I run the hazard of my own self, I think it fits to declare to thee the prediction of the gods. It cannot be that thou shouldest long continue in these bonds, but thou wilt soon be delivered from them, and wilt be promoted to the highest dignity and power, and thou wilt be envied by all those who now pity thy hard fortune, and thou wilt be happy till thy death, and wilt leave thine happiness to the children whom thou shalt have. But do thou remember, when thou seest this bird again, that thou wilt then live but five days longer. This event will be brought to pass by that God who hath sent this bird hither to be a sign unto thee, and I cannot but think it unjust to conceal from thee what I foreknow concerning thee that by thy knowing beforehand what happiness is coming upon thee, thou mayst not regard thy present misfortunes. But, when this happiness shall actually befall thee, do not forget what misery I am in myself, but endeavor to deliver me. So when the German had said this, he made Agrippa laugh at him, as much as he afterwards appeared worthy of admiration. But now Antonia took Agrippa's misfortune to heart. However, to speak to Tiberius on his behalf, she took to be a very difficult thing, and indeed quite impracticable as to any hope of success. Yet did she procure of Macro that the soldiers that kept him should be of a gentle nature, and that the centurion who was over them and was to diet with him should be of the same disposition, and that he might have leave to bathe himself every day, and that his freedmen and friends might come to him, and that other things that tended to ease him might be indulged him. So his friend Silas came into him, and two of his freedmen, Marcius, and Stechus brought him such sorts of food as he was fond of, and indeed took a great care of him. They also brought him garments, under pretense of selling them, and when night came on, they laid them under him. And the soldiers assisted them, as Macro had given them order to do beforehand. 
and this was Agrippa's condition for six months' time, and in this case were his affairs. But as for Tiberius, upon his return to Capriae, he fell sick. At first his distemper was but gentle, but as that distemper increased upon him, he had small or no hopes of recovery. Hereupon he bade Euodus, who was the freedman whom he most of all respected, to bring the children to him, for that he wanted to talk to them before he died. Now he had at present no sons of his own alive, for Drusus, who was his only son, was dead. But Drusus' son Tiberius was still living, whose additional name was Gamelus. There was also living Caius, the son of Germanicus, who was the son of his brother Drusus. He was now grown up, and had had a liberal education, and was well improved by it, and was esteem and favor with the people, on account of the excellent character of his father Germanicus, who had attained the highest honor among the multitude, by the firmness of his virtuous behavior, by the easiness and agreeableness of his conversing with the multitude, and because the dignity he was in did not hinder his familiarity with them all, as if they were his equals, by which behavior he was not only greatly esteemed by the people and the senate, but by every one of those nations that were subject to the Romans, some of whom were affected when they came to him, with the gracefulness of their reception by him, and others were affected in the same manner by the report of the others that had been with him. And, upon his death, there was a lamentation made by all men, not such a one as was to be made in way of flattery to their rulers, while they did but counterfeit sorrow, but such as was real, while everybody grieved at his death, as if they had lost one that was near to them. And truly such had been his easy conversation with men, that it turned greatly to the advantage of his son among all, and among others, the soldiery were so particularly affected to him, that they reckoned it an eligible thing, if need were, to die themselves, if he might but attain to the government. But when Tiberius had given order to Euodus to bring the children to him the next day in the morning, he prayed to his country gods to show him a manifest signal, which of those children should come to the government, being very desirous to leave it to his son's son, but still depending on what God would foreshadow concerning them more than upon his own opinion and inclination. So he made this to be the omen, that the government should be left to him who should come to him first the next day. When he had thus resolved within himself, he sent to his grandson's tutor, and ordered him to bring the child to him early in the morning, as supposing that God would permit him to be made emperor. But God approved opposite to his designation. For, while Tiberius was thus contriving matters, and as soon as it was at all day, he bid Euodus to call in that child which should be there ready. So he went out and found Caius before the door, for Tiberius was not yet come, but stayed waiting for his breakfast. For Euodus knew nothing of what his lord intended. So he said to Caius, Thy father calls thee, and then brought him in. As soon as Tiberius saw Caius, and not before, he reflected on the power of God, and how the ability of bestowing the government on whom he would was entirely taken from him and thence he was not able to establish what he had intended. So he greatly lamented that this power of establishing what he had before contrived was taken from him, and that his grandson Tiberius was not only to lose the Roman Empire by his fatality, but his own safety also, because his preservation would now depend upon such as would be more potent than himself, who would think it a thing not to be born that a kinsman should live with them, and so his relation would not be able to protect him, but he would be feared and hated by him who had the supreme authority partly on account of his being next to the empire, and partly on account of his perpetually contriving to get the government, both in order to preserve himself and to be at the head of affairs also. Now Tiberius had been very much given to astrology and the calculation of nativities, and had spent his life in the esteem of what predictions had proved true, more than those whose profession it was. Accordingly, when he once saw Galba coming into him, he said to his most intimate friends that there came in a man that would one day have the dignity of the Roman Empire, so that this Tiberius was more addicted to all such sorts of diviners than any other of the Roman emperors, because he had found them to have told the truth in his own affairs, and indeed he was now in great distress upon this accident that had befallen him, and was very much grieved at the destruction of his son's son, which he foresaw, and complained of himself that he should have made use of such a method of divination beforehand, while it was in his power to have died without grief by this knowledge of futurity, whereas he was not tormented by this foreknowledge of the misfortune of such as were dearest to him, and must die under that torment. Now, although he was disordered at this unexpected revolution of the government to those for whom he did not intend it, he spake thus to Caius, though unwillingly, and against his own inclination, O child, 
although Tiberius be nearer related to me than thou art, I, by my own determination, and the conspiring suffrage of the gods, do give and put into thy hand the Roman Empire. And I desire thee never to be unmindful when thou comest to it, either of my kindness to thee, who set thee in so high a dignity, or of thy relation to Tiberius. But as thou knowest that I am, together with and after the gods, the procurer of so great happiness to thee, so I desire that thou wilt make me a return for my readiness to assist thee, and wilt take care of Tiberius because of his near relation to thee. Besides which, thou art to know that, while Tiberius is alive, he will be a security to thee, both as to empire and as to thy own preservation. But if he die, that will be a prelude to thy own misfortunes. For to be alone under the weight of such vast affairs is very dangerous, nor will the gods suffer those actions which are unjustly done, contrary to that law which directs men to do otherwise, to go off unpunished. This was the speech which Tiberius made, which did not persuade Caius to act accordingly, although he promised so to do. But, when he was settled in the government, he took off this Tiberius, as was predicted by the other Tiberius, as he was also himself, in no long time afterward, slain by a secret plot laid against him. So when Tiberius had at this time appointed Caius to be his successor, he outlived but few days, and then died, after he had held the government twenty-two years, five months, and three days. Now Caius was the fourth emperor, but when the Romans understood that Tiberius was dead, they rejoiced at the good news, but had not courage to believe it, not because they were unwilling it should be true, for they would have given large sums of money that it might be so, but because they were afraid that if they had shown their joy when the news proved false, their joy should be openly known, and they should be accused for it, and thereby undone. For this Tiberius had brought a vast number of miseries on the best families of the Romans, since he was easily inflamed with passion in all cases, and was of such a temper as rendered his anger irrevocable, till he had executed the same, although he had taken a hatred against men without reason, for he was by nature fierce in all the sentences he gave, and made death the penalty for the slightest offenses, insomuch that when the Romans heard the rumor about his death gladly, they were restrained from the enjoyment of that pleasure by the dread of such miseries as they foresaw would follow, if their hopes proved ill-grounded. Now Marcius, Agrippa's freedman, as soon as he heard of Tiberius' death, came running to tell Agrippa the news, and finding him going out to the bath, he gave him a nod, and said in the Hebrew tongue, The lion is dead, who, understanding his meaning, and being overjoyed at the news, Nay, said he, but all sorts of thanks and happiness attend thee for this news of thine. Only I wish that what thou sayest may prove true. Now the centurion who was set to keep Agrippa, when he saw with what haste Marcius came, and what joy Agrippa had from what he said, he had a suspicion that his words implied some great innovation of affairs, and he asked them about what was said. They at first diverted the discourse, but upon his further pressing, Agrippa, without more ado, told him, for he was already become his friend. So he joined with him in that pleasure which this news occasioned, because it would be fortunate to Agrippa, and made him a supper. But as they were feasting, and the cups went about, there came one who said that Tiberius was still alive, and would return to the city in a few days. At which news the centurion was exceedingly troubled, because he had done what might cost him his life to have treated so joyfully a prisoner and this upon the news of the death of Caesar. So he thrust Agrippa from the couch whereon he lay, and said, Dost thou think to cheat me by a lie about the emperor without punishment? And shalt not thou pay for this thy malicious report at the price of thine head? When he had so said, he ordered Agrippa to be bound again, for he had loosed him before, and kept a severer guard over him than formerly, and in that evil condition was Agrippa that night. But the next day, the rumor increased in the city, and confirmed the news that Tiberius was certainly dead, insomuch that men durst now openly and freely talk about it. Nay, some offered sacrifices on that account. Several letters also came from Caius, one of them to the Senate, which informed them of the death of Tiberius and of his own entrance on the government. Another to Piso, the governor of the city, which told him the same thing. He also gave order that Agrippa should be removed out of the camp and to go to that house where he lived before he was put in prison so that he was not out of fear as to his own affairs. For, although he was still in custody, yet it was now with ease to his own affairs. Now, as soon as Caius was come to Rome, and had brought Tiberius's dead body with him, and had made a sumptuous funeral for him, according to the laws of his country, he was much disposed to set Agrippa at liberty that very day. But Antonia hindered him, 
not out of any ill will to the prisoner, but out of regard to decency and Caius, lest that should make men believe that he received the death of Tiberius with pleasure, when he loosed one whom he had bound immediately. However, there did not many days pass ere he sent for him to his house, and had him shaved, and made him change his raiment, after which he put a diadem upon his head, and appointed him to be king of the Tetrarchy of Philip. He also gave him the Tetrarchy of Lysanias, and changed his iron chain for a golden one of equal weight. He also sent Marulus to be procurator of Judea. Now, in the second year of the reign of Caius Caesar, Agrippa desired leave to be given him to sail home and settle the affairs of his government, and he promised to return again when he had put the rest in order, as it ought to be put. So upon the emperor's permission, he came into his own country, and appeared to them all unexpectedly as a king, and thereby demonstrated to the men that saw him the power of fortune, when they compared his former poverty with his present happy affluence. So some called him a happy man, and others could not well believe that things were so much changed with him for the better. Chapter 7 How Herod the Tetrarch Was Banished But Herodias, Agrippa's sister, who now lived as a wife to that Herod, who was Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, took this authority of her brother in an envious manner, particularly when she saw that he had a greater dignity bestowed on him than her husband had, since, when he ran away, he was not able to pay his debts, and now he was come back, it was because he was in a way of dignity and of great fortune. She was therefore grieved and much displeased at so great a mutation of his affairs, and chiefly, when she saw him marching among the multitude with the usual ensigns of royal authority, she was not able to conceal how miserable she was by reason of the envy she had towards him. But she excited her husband, and desired him that he would sail to Rome to court honors equal to his. For she said that she could not bear to live any longer, while Agrippa, the son of that Aristobulus who was condemned to die by his father, one that came to her husband in such extreme poverty, that the necessaries of life were forced to be entirely supplied him day by day, and when he fled away from his creditors by sea, he now returned a king, while he was himself the son of a king, and while the near relation he bare to royal authority, he called upon him to gain the like dignity, he sat still, and was contented with a privater life. But then, Herod, although thou wast formerly not concerned to be in a lower condition than thy father, from whom thou wast derived, had been, Yet do thou now seek after the dignity which thy kinsman hath attained to, and do not thou bear this contempt that a man who admired thy riches should be greater in honor than thyself, nor suffer his poverty to show itself able to purchase greater things than our abundance, nor do thou esteem it other than a shameful thing to be inferior to one who, the other day, lived upon thy charity. But let us go to Rome, and let us spare no pains or expenses, either of silver or gold, since they cannot be kept for any better use than for the obtaining of a kingdom. But for Herod, he opposed her request at this time, out of the love of ease and having a suspicion of the trouble he should have at Rome. So he tried to instruct her better, but the more she saw him draw back, the more she pressed him to it, and desired him to leave no stone unturned in order to be king. And at last, she left not off till she engaged him, whether he would or not, to be of her sentiments, because he could no otherwise avoid her importunity. So he got all things ready, after as sumptuous a manner as he was able, and spared for nothing, and went up to Rome, and took Herodias along with him. But Agrippa, when he was made sensible of their intentions and preparations, he also prepared to go thither. And as soon as he heard they set sail, he sent Fortunatus, one of his freedmen, to Rome, to carry presents to the emperor, and letters against Herod, and to give Caius a particular account of those matters, if he should have any opportunity. This man followed Herod so quick, and had so prosperous a voyage, and came so little after Herod, that while Herod was with Caius, he came himself, and delivered his letters. For they both sailed to Dysarchia, and found Caius at Baie, which is itself a little city of Campania, at the distance of about five furlongs from Dysarchia. There are in that place royal palaces, with sumptuous apartments, every emperor still endeavoring to outdo his predecessor's magnificence. The place also affords warm baths that spring out of the ground of their own accord, which are of advantage for the recovery of the health of those that make use of them. And, besides, they minister to men's luxury also. Now Caius saluted Herod, for he first met with him, and then looked upon the letters which Agrippa had sent him, and which were written in order to accuse Herod, wherein he accused him that he had been in confederacy with Seginus against Tiberius's government, 
and that he was now confederate with Artabanus, the king of Parthia, in opposition to the government of Caius, as a demonstration of which he alleged that he had armor sufficient for 70,000 men ready in his armory. Caius was moved at this information and asked Herod whether what he said about the armor was true. And when he confessed there was such armor there, for he could not deny the same, the truth of it being too notorious, Caius took that to be a sufficient proof of the accusation that he intended to revolt. So he took away from his tetrarchy and gave it by way of addition to Agrippa's kingdom. He also gave Herod's money to Agrippa and by way of punishment awarded him a perpetual banishment and appointed Lines a city of Gaul to be his place of habitation. But when he was informed that Herodias was Agrippa's sister, he made her a present of what money was her own and told her that it was her brother who prevented her being put under the same calamity with her husband. But she made this reply, Thou indeed, O Emperor, actest after a magnificent manner, and as becomes thyself, and what thou offerest me. But the kindness which I have for my husband hinders me from partaking of the favor of thy gift, for it is not just that I who have been made a partner in his prosperity should forsake him in his misfortunes. Hereupon Caius was angry at her, and sent her with Herod into banishment, and gave her estate to Agrippa. And thus did God punish Herodias for her envy at her brother, and Herod also for giving ear to the vain discourses of a woman. Now Caius managed public affairs with great magnanimity during the first and second year of his reign, and behaved himself with such moderation that he gained the goodwill of the Romans themselves and of his other subjects. But, in process of time, he went beyond the bounds of human nature in his conceit of himself, and, by reason of the vastness of his dominions, made himself a god, and took upon himself to act in all things to the reproach of the deity itself. Chapter 8 Concerning the embassage of the Jews to Caius, how Caius sent Petronius into Syria to make war against the Jews unless they would receive his statue. There was now a tumult arisen at Alexandria between the Jewish inhabitants and the Greeks, and three ambassadors were chosen out of each party that were at variance who came to Caius. Now, one of these ambassadors from the people of Alexandria was Apion, who uttered many blasphemies against the Jews, and, among other things, that he said he charged them with neglecting the honors that belonged to Caesar, for that while all who were subject to the Roman Empire built altars and temples to Caius, and in other regards universally received him as they received the gods, these Jews alone thought it a dishonorable thing for them to erect statues in honor of him, as well as to swear by his name. Many of these severe things were said by Apion, by which he hoped to provoke Caius to anger at the Jews, as he was likely to be. But Philo, the principal of the Jewish embassage, a man eminent on all accounts, brother to Alexander the Alabarch, and one not unskillful in philosophy, was ready to betake himself to make his defense against those accusations. But Caius prohibited him, and bade him be gone. He was also in such a rage that it openly appeared he was about to do them some very great mischief. So Philo, being thus affronted, went out, and said to those Jews who were about him, that they should be of good courage, since Caius's words indeed showed anger at them, but in reality had already set God against himself. Hereupon Caius, taking it very heinously that he should be thus despised by the Jews alone, sent Petronius to be president of Syria and successor in the government to Vitellius, and gave him order to make an invasion into Judea with a great body of troops, and if they would admit of his statue willingly, to erect it in the temple of God, but if they were obstinate, to conquer them by war and then to do it. Accordingly Petronius took the government of Syria and made haste to obey Caesar's epistle, he got together as great a number of auxiliaries as he possibly could, and took with him two legions of the Roman army, and came to Ptolemaeus, and there wintered, as intending to set about the war in the spring. He also wrote words to Caius, what he had resolved to do, who commended him for his alacrity, and ordered him to go on, and to make war with them, in case they would not obey his commands. But there came many thousands of the Jews to Petronius, to Ptolemaeus, to offer their petitions to him, that he would not compel them to transgress and violate the law of their forefathers. But if, said they, thou art entirely resolved to bring this statue and erect it, do thou first kill us, and then do what thou hast resolved on. For, while we are alive, we cannot permit such things as are forbidden us to be done by the authority of our legislator, and by our forefathers' determination that such prohibitions are instances of virtue. But Petronius was angry at them, and said, 
If indeed I were myself emperor, and were at liberty to follow my own inclination, and then had designed to act thus, these your words would be justly spoken to me. But now Caesar hath sent to me, I am under the necessity of being subservient to his decrees, because a disobedience to them will bring upon me inevitable destruction. Then the Jews replied, Since therefore thou art so disposed, O Petronius, that thou wilt not disobey Caius's epistles, neither will we transgress the commands of our law, and as we depend upon the excellency of our laws, and, by the labors of our ancestors, have continued hitherto without suffering them to be transgressed, we dare not by any means suffer ourselves to be so timorous as to transgress those laws out of the fear of death, which God hath determined are for our advantage. And, if we fall into misfortunes, we will bear them, in order to preserve our laws, as knowing that those who expose themselves to dangers have good hope of escaping them, because God will stand on our side, when out of regard to him we undergo afflictions, and sustain the uncertain turns of fortune. But, if we should submit to thee, we should be greatly reproached for our cowardice, as thereby showing ourselves ready to transgress our law, and we should incur the great anger of God also, who, even thyself, being judge, is superior to Caius. When Petronius saw by their words that their determination was hard to be removed, and that, without a war, he should not be able to be subservient to Caius in the dedication of his statue, and that there must be a great deal of bloodshed, he took his friends and the servants that were about him, and hasted to Tiberius, as wanting to know in what posture the affairs of the Jews were. And many ten thousands of the Jews met Petronius again when he was come to Tiberius. These thought that they must run a mighty hazard if they should have a war with the Romans, but judged that the transgression of the law was of much greater consequence, and made supplication to him that he would by no means reduce them to such distresses, nor defile their city with the dedication of the statue. Then Petronius said to them, Will you then make war with Caesar without considering his great preparations for war and your own weakness? They replied, We will not by any means make war with him, but still we die before we see our laws transgressed. So they threw themselves down upon their faces and stretched out their throats and said they were ready to be slain. And this they did for forty days together, and in the meantime left off the tilling of their ground, and that while the season of the year required them to sow it. Thus they continued firm in their resolution, and proposed to themselves to die willingly, rather than to see the dedication of the statue. When matters were in this state, Aristobulus, King Agrippa's brother, and Helsius the Great, and the other principal men of that family with them, went in unto Petronius, and besought him, that, since he saw the resolution of the multitude, he would not make any alteration, and thereby drive them to despair, but would write to Caius that the Jews had an insuperable aversion to the reception of the statue, and how they continued with him, and left off the tillage of their ground, that they were not willing to go to war with him, because they were not able to do it, but were ready to die with pleasure, rather than to suffer their laws to be transgressed, and how, upon the lands continuing unsown, robberies would grow up on the inability they would be under of paying their tributes, and that perhaps Caius might be thereby moved to pity, and not order any barbarous action to be done to them, nor think of destroying the nation that if he continues inflexible in his former opinion to bring a war upon them, he may then set about it himself. And thus did Aristobulus and the rest with him supplicate Petronius. So Petronius, partly on account of the pressing instance which Aristobulus and the rest with him made, and because of the great consequence of what they desired, and the earnestness wherewith they made their supplication, partly on account of the firmness of the opposition made by the Jews, which he saw, while he thought it a horrible thing for him to be such a slave to the madness of Caius, as to slay so many ten thousand men, only because of their religious disposition towards God, and after that, to pass his life in expectation of punishment. Petronius, I say, thought it much better to send to Caius, and to let him know how intolerable it was to him, to bear the anger he might have against him for not serving him sooner, in obedience to his epistle, for that perhaps he might persuade him, and that if this mad resolution continued, he might then begin the war against them. Nay, that in case he should turn his hatred against himself, it was fit for virtuous persons even to die for the sake of such vast multitudes of men. Accordingly, he determined to hearken to the petitions in this matter. He then called the Jews together to Tiberius, who came many ten thousands in number. He also placed that army he now had with him opposite to them, but did not discover his own meaning, but the commands of the emperor, and told them that his wrath would, without delay, be executed on such as had the courage to disobey what he had commanded, and this immediately. 
and that it was fit for him, who had received so great a dignity by his grant, not to contradict him in anything. Yet, said he, I do not think it just to have such a regard to my own safety and honor as to refuse to sacrifice them for your preservation, who are so many in number, and endeavor to preserve the regard that is due to your law, which as it hath come down to you from your forefathers, so do you esteem it worthy of your uttermost contention to preserve it. Nor, with the supreme assistance and power of God, will I be so hardy as to suffer your temple to fall into contempt by the means of the imperial authority. I will, therefore, send to Caius, and let him know what your resolutions are, and will assist your suit as far as I am able, that you may not be exposed to suffer on account of the honest designs you have proposed to yourselves. And may God be your assistant, for his authority is beyond all the contrivance and power of men. And may he procure you the preservation of your ancient laws, and may not he be deprived, though without your consent, of his accustomed honors. But if Caius be irritated, and turn the violence of his rage upon me, I will rather undergo all that danger and that affliction that may come either on my body or my soul than see so many of you perish while you are acting in so excellent a manner. Do you therefore, every one of you, go your way about your own occupations and fall to the cultivation of your ground. I will myself send to Rome and will not refuse to serve you in all things, both by myself and by my friends. When Petronius had said this and had dismissed the assembly of the Jews, he desired the principle of them to take care of their husbandry, and to speak kindly to the people, and encourage them to have good hope of their affairs. Thus did he readily bring the multitude to be cheerful again. And now did God show his presence to Petronius, and signify to him that he would afford him his assistance in his whole design. For he had no sooner finished the speech that he made to the Jews, but God sent down great showers of rain, contrary to human expectation. For that day was a clear day, and gave no sign by the appearance of the sky of any rain. Nay, the whole year had been subject to a great drought, and made men despair of any water from above, even when at any time they saw the heavens overcast with clouds, insomuch that when they saw such a great quantity of rain came, and that in an unusual manner, and without any other expectation of it, the Jews hoped that Petronius would by no means fail in his petition for them. But as to Petronius, he was mightily surprised when he perceived that God evidently took care of the Jews, and gave very plain signs of his appearance, and this to such a degree that those that were in earnest much inclined to the contrary had no power left to contradict it. This was also among those other particulars which he wrote to Caius, which all tended to dissuade him, and by all means to entreat him not to make so many ten thousands of these men go distracted, whom, if he should slay, for without war they would by no means suffer the laws of their worship to be set aside. He would lose the revenue they paid him, and would be publicly cursed by them for all future ages. Moreover, that God, who was their governor, had shown his power most evidently on their account, and that such a power of his as left no room for doubt about it. And this was the business that Petronius was now engaged in. But King Agrippa, who now lived at Rome, was more and more in the favor of Caius, and when he had once made him a supper, and was careful to exceed all others, both in expenses and in such preparations as might contribute most to his pleasure, nay, it was so far from the ability of others that Caius himself could never equal, much less exceed it, such care he had taken beforehand to exceed all men, and particularly to make all agreeable to Caesar. Hereupon, Caius admired his understanding and magnificence that he should force himself to do all to please him, even beyond such expenses as he could bear, and was desirous not to be behind Agrippa in that generosity which he exerted in order to please him. So Caius, when he had drank wine plentifully, and was merrier than ordinary, said thus during the feast, when Agrippa had drank to him, I knew before now how great a respect thou hast had for me, and how great kindness thou hast shown me, though with those hazards to thyself which thou underwentest under Tiberius on that account, nor hast thou omitted anything to show thy good will towards us, even beyond thy ability, whence it would be a base thing for me to be conquered by thy affection. I am therefore desirous to make thee amends for everything in which I have been formerly deficient, for everything that I have bestowed on thee that may be called my gifts is but little. Everything that may contribute to thy happiness shall be at thy service, and that cheerfully, and so far as my ability will reach. And this was what Caius said to Agrippa, thinking he would ask for some large country, or the revenues of certain cities. But although he had prepared beforehand what he would ask, yet had he not discovered his intentions, but made this answer to Caius immediately, that it was not out of any expectation of gain that he formerly paid his respects to him, 
contrary to the commands of Tiberius, nor did he now do anything relating to him out of regard to his own advantage, and in order to receive anything from him, that the gifts he had already bestowed upon him were great, and even beyond the hopes of a craving man. For, although they may be beneath thy power, who art the donor, yet are they greater than my inclination and dignity, who am the receiver. And, as Caius was astonished at Agrippa's inclinations, and still the more pressed him to make his request for somewhat which he might gratify him with, Agrippa replied, Since thou, O my lord, declarest such as thy readiness to grant, and I am worthy of thy gifts, I will ask nothing relating to my own felicity, for what thou hast already bestowed on me has made me excel therein. But I desire somewhat which may make thee glorious for piety, and render the divinity assistant to thy designs, and may be for an honor to me among those that inquire about it, as showing that I never once fail of obtaining what I desire of thee. For my petition is this, that thou wilt no longer think of the dedication of that statue which thou hast ordered to be set up in the Jewish temple by Petronius. And thus did Agrippa venture to cast the die upon this occasion. So great was the affair in his opinion, and in reality, though he knew how dangerous a thing it was, so to speak, for, had not Caius approved it, it had tended to no less than the loss of his life. So Caius, who was mightily taken with Agrippa's obliging behavior, and on other accounts, thinking it a dishonorable thing to be guilty of falsehood before so many witnesses, in points wherein he had with such alacrity forced Agrippa to become a petitioner, and that it would look as if he had already repented of what he had said, and because he greatly admired Agrippa's virtue, and not desiring him at all to augment his own dominions, either with larger revenues or other authority, but took care of the public tranquility of the laws and of the divinity itself, he granted him what he requested. He also wrote thus to Petronius, commending him for his assembling his army, and then consulting him about these affairs. If, therefore, said he, thou hast already erected my statue, let it stand, but if thou hast not yet dedicated it, do not trouble thyself further about it, but dismiss thy army, go back, and take care of those affairs which I sent thee about at first, for I have now no occasion for the erection of that statue. This I have granted as a favor to Agrippa, a man whom I honor so very greatly, that I am not able to contradict what he would have, or what he desired me to do for him. And this was what Caius wrote to Petronius, which was before he received his letter, informing him that the Jews were very ready to revolt about this statue, and that they seemed resolved to threaten war against the Romans, and nothing else. When therefore Caius was much displeased that any attempt should be made against his government, as he was a slave to base and vicious actions on all occasions, and had no regard to what was virtuous and honorable, and against whomever he resolved to show his anger, and that for any cause whatsoever, he suffered not himself to be restrained by any admonition, but thought the indulging his anger to be a real pleasure. He wrote thus to Petronius, Seeing thou esteemest the presence made thee by the Jews to be of greater value than my commands, and art grown insolent enough to be subservient to their pleasure, I charge thee to become thy own judge, and to consider what thou art to do, now thou art under my displeasure. For I will make thee an example to the present, and to all future ages, that they may not dare to contradict the commands of their emperor. This was the epistle which Caius wrote to Petronius, but Petronius did not receive it while Caius was alive. That ship which carried it sailed so slow, the other letters came to Petronius before this, by which he understood that Caius was dead. For God would not forget the dangers Petronius had undertaken on account of the Jews, and of his own honor. But when he had taken Caius away, out of his indignation of what he had so insolently attempted, in assuming to himself divine worship, both Rome and all that dominion conspired with Petronius, especially those that were of the senatorian order, to give Caius his due reward, because he had been unmercifully severe to them. For he died not long after he had written to Petronius that epistle which threatened him with death. But as for the occasion of his death, and the nature of the plot against him, I shall relate them in the progress of this narration. Now that epistle which informed Petronius of Caius' death came first, and a little afterward came that which commanded him to kill himself with his own hands. Whereupon, he rejoiced at this coincidence as to the death of Caius, and admired God's providence, who without the least delay, immediately gave him a reward for the regard he had to the temple and the assistance he afforded the Jews for avoiding the dangers they were in. And by this means, Petronius escaped that danger of death which he could not foresee. Chapter 9 What befell the Jews that were in Babylon on occasion of Asinius and Anilius, two brethren? A very sad calamity now befell the Jews that were in Mesopotamia, 
and especially those that dwelt in Babylonia. Inferior it was to none of the calamities which had gone before, and came together with a great slaughter of them, and that greater than any upon record before, concerning all which I shall speak more accurately, and shall explain the occasions whence these miseries came upon them. There was a city of Babylonia, called Nierda, not only a very populous one, but one that had a good and large territory about it, and, besides its other advantages, full of men also. It was, besides, not easily to be assaulted by enemies, from the river Euphrates encompassing it all round, and from the walls that were built about it. There was also the city Nisibis, situate on the same current of river, for which reason the Jews, depending on the natural strength of these places, deposited in them that half shekel which everyone, by the custom of our country, offers unto God, as well as they did other things devoted to him. For they made use of these cities as a treasury, whence at a proper time they were transmitted to Jerusalem. And many ten thousand men undertook the carriage of those donations, out of fear of the ravages of the Parthenians, to whom the Babylonians were subject. Now there were two men, Asinius and Anilius, of the city Nierda, by birth, and brethren to one another. They were destitute of a father, and their mother put them to learn the art of weaving curtains, it not being esteemed a disgrace among them for men to be weavers of cloth. Now, he that taught them that art, and was set over them, com complained that they came too late to their work, and punished them with stripes. But they took this just punishment as an affront, and carried off all the weapons which were kept in that house, which were not a few, and went into a certain place where there was a partition of the rivers, and was a place naturally very fit for the feeding of cattle, and for preserving such fruits as were usually laid up against winter. The poorest sort of the young men also resorted to them, whom they armed with the weapons they had gotten, and became their captains, and nothing hindered them from being their leaders into mischief. For, as soon as they were come invincible, and had built them a citadel, they sent to such as fed cattle, and ordered them to pay so much tribute out of them as might be sufficient for their maintenance, proposing also that they would be their friends if they would submit to them, and that they would defend them from all their other enemies on every side, but that they would kill the cattle of those that refused to obey them. So they hearkened to their proposals, for they could do nothing else, and sent them as many sheep as were required of them, whereby their forces grew greater, and they became lords over all they pleased, because they marched suddenly and did them a mischief insomuch that everybody who had to do with them chose to pay them respect. And they became formidable to such as came to assault them, till the report about them came to the ears of the king of Parthia himself. But when the governor of Babylonia understood this, and had a mind to put a stop to them before they grew greater, and before greater mischiefs should arise from them, he got together as great an army as he could, both of Parthians and Babylonians, and marched against them thinking to attack them and destroy them before anyone should carry them the news that he had got an army together. He then encamped at a lake and lay still. But on the next day, it was the Sabbath, which is among the Jews a day of rest from all sorts of work. He supposed that the army would not dare to fight him thereon, but that he would take them and carry them away prisoners without fighting. He therefore proceeded gradually and thought to fall upon them on the sudden. Now Asinius was sitting with the rest, and their weapons lay by them, upon which he said, Sirs, I hear a neighing of horses, not of such as are feeding, but such as have men on their backs. I also hear such a noise of their bridles, that I am afraid that some enemies are coming upon us to encompass us round. However, let somebody go to look about, and make a report of what reality there is in the present state of things, and may what I have said prove a false alarm. And when he had said this, some of them went out to spy out what was the matter, and they came again immediately, and said to him, That neither hast thou been mistaken in telling us what our enemies were doing, nor will those enemies permit us to be injurious to people any longer. We are caught by their intrigues like brute beasts, and there is a large body of cavalry marching upon us, while we are destitute of hands to defend ourselves withal, because we are restrained from doing it by the prohibition of our law, which obliges us to rest on this day. But Asinius did not by any means agree with the opinion of his spy as to what was to be done, but thought it more agreeable to the law to pluck up their spirits in this necessity they were fallen into, and break their law by avenging themselves, although they should die in the action, than by doing nothing to please their enemies in submitting to be slain by them. Accordingly, he took up his weapons, and infused courage into those that were with him, to act as courageously as himself. So they fell upon their enemies, and slew a great many of them, because they despised them, and came as to a certain victory, and put the rest to flight.
But when the news of this fight came to the king of Parthia, he was surprised at the boldness of these brethren, and was desirous to see them and speak with them. He therefore sent the most trusty of all his guards to say thus to them, That king Artabanus, although he had been unjustly treated by you, who have made an attempt against his government, yet hath he more regard to your courageous behavior than to the anger he bears to you, and hath sent me to give you his right hand and security, and he permits you to come to him safely and without any violence upon the road, and he wants to have you address yourselves to him as friends without meaning any guile or deceit to you. He also promises to make you presents and to pay you those respects which will make an addition of his power to your courage and thereby be of advantage to you. Yet did Asinius himself put off his journey thither, but sent his brother Anilius with all such presents as he could procure. So he went and was admitted to the king's presence, and when Artabanus saw Anilius coming alone, he inquired into the reason why Asinius avoided to come alone with him. And when he understood that he was afraid and stayed by the lake, he took an oath by the gods of his country that he would do them no harm if they came to him upon the assurances he gave them and gave him his right hand. This is of the greatest force there with all these barbarians and affords a firm security to those who converse with them. For none of them will deceive you once they have given you their right hands, nor will anyone doubt their fidelity when that is once given, even though they were before suspected of injustice. When Artabanus had done this, he sent away Anilius to persuade his brother to come to him. Now this the king did, because he wanted to curb his own governors of provinces by the courage of these Jewish brethren, lest they should make a league with them, for they were ready for a revolt, and were disposed to rebel, had they been sent on an expedition against them. He was also afraid, lest when he was engaged in a war, in order to subdue those governors of provinces that had revolted, the party of Asinius and those in Babylonia should be augmented, and either make war upon him when they should hear of that revolt, or, if they should be disappointed in that case, they would not fail of doing further mischief to him. When the king had these intentions, he sent away Anilius, and Anilius prevailed on his brother to come to the king, when he had related to him the king's good will and the oath that he had taken. Accordingly, they made haste to go to Artabanus, who received them when they were come with pleasure, and admired Asinius's courage in the actions he had done, and this because he was a little man to see to, and at first sight appeared contemptible also, and such as one might deem a person of no value at all. He also said to his friends, how, upon the comparison, he showed his soul to be, in all respects, superior to his body. And when as they were drinking together, he once showed Asinius to Abdagases, one of the generals of his army, and told him his name, and described the great courage he was of in war, and Abdagases had desired leave to kill him, and thereby to inflict upon him a punishment for those injuries he had done to the Parthian government. The king replied, I will never give thee leave to kill a man who hath depended on my faith, especially not after I have set him my right hand, and endeavored to gain his belief by oaths made by the gods. But, if thou beest a truly warlike man, thou standest not in need of my perjury. Go thou, then, and avenge the Parthian government. Attack this man when he is returned back, and conquer him by the forces that are under thy command without my privity. Hereupon, the king called for Asinius, and said to him, It is time for thee, O thou young man, to return home, and not provoke the indignation of my generals in this place any longer, lest they attempt to murder thee, and that without my approbation. I commit to thee the country of Babylonia in trust, that it may, by thy care, be preserved free from robbers and from other mischiefs. I have kept my faith inviolable to thee, and that not in trifling affairs, but in those that concerned thy safety, and do therefore deserve thou shouldest be kind to me. When he had said this, and given Asinius some presents, he sent him away immediately, who, when he was come home, built fortresses, and became great in a little time, and managed things with such courage and success as no other person that had no higher a beginning ever did before him. Those Parthian governors also, who were sent that way, paid him great respect, and the honor that was paid him by the Babylonians seemed to them too small and beneath his deserts, although he were in no small dignity and power there. Nay, indeed, all the affairs of Mesopotamia depended upon him, and he more and more flourished in this happy condition of his for fifteen years. But as their affairs were in so flourishing a state, there sprang up a calamity among them on the following occasion. When once they had deviated from that course of virtue whereby they had gained so great power, they affronted and transgressed the laws of their forefathers, and fell under the dominion of their lusts and pleasures. A certain Parthian, who came as a general of an army into those parts, 
had a wife following him who had a vast reputation for other accomplishments, and particularly was admired above all other women for her beauty. Anilius, the brother of Asinius, either heard of that her beauty from others, or perhaps saw her himself also, and so became at once her lover and her enemy. Partly because he could not hope to enjoy this woman, but by obtaining power over her as a captive, and partly because he thought he could not conquer his inclinations for her. As soon, therefore, as her husband had been declared an enemy to them, and was fallen in the battle, the widow of the deceased was married to this her lover. However, this woman did not come into their house without producing great misfortunes, both to Anilius himself and to Asinius also, but brought great mischiefs upon them on the occasion following. Since she was led away captive on the death of her husband, she concealed the images of those gods which were their country gods, common to her husband and herself. Now it is the custom of that country for all to have the idols they worship in their own houses and to carry them along with them when they go into a foreign land, agreeable to which custom of theirs she carried her idols with her. Now, at first, she performed her worship to them privately, but when she was become an Ilias's married wife, she worshipped them in her accustomed manner and with the same appointed ceremonies which she used in her former husband's days, upon which their most esteemed friends blamed him at first that he did not act after the manner of the Hebrews, nor perform what was agreeable to their laws in marrying a foreign wife, and when that transgressed the accurate appointments of their sacrifices and religious ceremonies, that he ought to consider, lest by allowing himself in many pleasures of the body he might lose his principality on account of the beauty of a wife, and that high authority which by God's blessing he had arrived at. But when they prevailed not at all upon him, he slew one of them for whom he had greatest respect, because of the liberty he took with him, who, when he was dying, out of regard to the laws, imprecated a punishment upon his murderer Anilius and upon Asinius also, and that all their companions might come to a like end from their enemies, upon the two first as the principal actors of this wickedness, and upon the rest as those that would not assist him when he suffered in the defense of their laws. Now these latter were sorely grieved, yet did they tolerate these doings, because they remembered that they had arrived at their present happy state by no other means than their fortitude. But when they also heard of the worship of those gods whom the Parthenians adore, they thought the injury that Anilius offered to their laws was to be borne no longer, and a greater number of them came to Asinius, and loudly complained of Anilius, and told him that it had been well that he had of himself seen what was advantageous to them, but that however, it was now high time to correct what had been done amiss, before the crime that had been committed proved the ruin of himself and all the rest of them. They added that the marriage of this woman was made without their consent and without a regard to their old laws, and that the worship which this woman paid to her gods was a reproach to the god whom they worshipped. Now Asinius was sensible of his brother's offense, that it had been already the cause of great mischiefs and would be so for the time to come. Yet did he tolerate the same from the goodwill he had to so near a relation, and for giving it to him on account that his brother was quite overborne by his wicked inclinations. But as more and more still came about him every day, and the clamors about it became greater, he at length spake to Anilius about these clamors, reproving him for his former actions, and desiring him for the future to leave them off and send the woman back to her relations. But nothing was gained by these reproofs, for as the woman perceived what a tumult was made among the people on her account, and was afraid for Anilius, lest he should come to any harm for his love to her, she infused poison into Asinius' food, and hereby took him off, and was now secure of prevailing, when her lover was to be judge of what should be done about her. So Anilius took the government upon himself alone, and led his army against the villages of Mithridates, who was a man of principal authority in Parthia, and had married King Artabanus' daughter. He also plundered them, and among that prey was found much money, and many slaves, as also a great number of sheep, and many other things, which, when he gained, make men's condition happy. Now, when Mithridates, who was there at this time, heard that his villages were taken, he was very much displeased to find that Anilius had first begun to injure him and to affront him in his present dignity, when he had not offered any injury to him beforehand. And he got together the greatest body of horsemen he was able, and those out of that number which were of an age fit for war, and came to fight Anilius. And when he was arrived at a certain village of his own, he lay still there, as intending to fight him on the day following, because it was the Sabbath, the day on which the Jews rest. And when Anilius was informed of this by a Syrian stranger of another village, who not only gave him an exact account of other circumstances, but told him where Mithridates would have a feast, he took his supper at a proper time, and marched by night, 
with an intent of falling upon the Parthians while they were unapprised what they should do. So he fell upon them about the fourth watch of the night, and some of them he slew while they were asleep, and others he put to flight, and took Mithridates alive, and set him naked upon an ass, which among the Parthians is esteemed the greatest reproach possible. And when he had brought him into a wood with such a resolution, and his friends desired him to kill Mithridates, he soon told them his own mind to the contrary, and said that it was not right to kill a man who was one of the principal families among the Parthians, and greatly honored with matching into the royal family, that so far as they had hitherto gone was tolerable, for although they had injured Mithridates, yet if they preserved his life, this benefit would be remembered by him to the advantage of those that gave it him, but that if he were once put to death, the king would not be at rest till he had made a great slaughter of the Jews that dwelt at Babylon, to whose safety we ought to have a regard, both on account of our relation to them, and because, if any misfortune befall us, we have no other place to retire to, since he hath gotten the flower of their youth under him. By this thought, and this speech of his maiden counsel, he persuaded them to act accordingly. So Mithridates was let go. But when he was got away, his wife reproached him, that although he was son-in-law to the king, he neglected to avenge himself on those that had injured him, while he took no care about it, but was contented to have been made a captive by the Jews, and to have escaped them. And she bade him either to go back like a man of courage, or else she swear by the gods of their royal family that she would certainly dissolve her marriage with him. Upon which, partly because he could not bear the daily trouble of her taunts, and partly because he was afraid of her insolence, lest she should in earnest dissolve their marriage, he unwillingly, and against his inclinations, got together again as great an army as he could, and marched along with them, as himself thinking it a thing not to be born any longer, that he, a Parthian, should owe his preservation to the Jews when they had been too hard for him in the war. But as soon as Anilius understood that Mithridates was marching with a great army against him, he thought it too ignominious a thing to tarry about the lakes, and not to take the first opportunity of meeting his enemies, and he hoped to have the same success, and to beat their enemies as they did before, as also he ventured boldly upon the like attempts. Accordingly, he led out his army, and a great many more joined themselves to that army, in order to betake themselves to plunder the people, and in order to terrify the enemy again by their numbers. But when they had marched ninety furlongs, while the road had been through dry and sandy places, and about the midst of the day they were become very thirsty, and Mithridates appeared, and fell upon them as they were in distress for want of water, on which account, and on account of the time of the day, they were not able to bear their weapons. So Anilius and his men were put to an ignominious rout, while men in despair were to attack those that were fresh and in good plight. So a great slaughter was made, and many ten thousand men fell. Now Anilius and all that stood firm about him ran away, as fast as they were able, into a wood, and afforded Mithridates the pleasure of having gained a great victory over them. But there now came into Anilius a conflux of bad men, who regarded their own lives very little if they might but gain some present ease, insomuch that they, by thus coming to him, compensated the multitude of those that perished in the fight. Yet were not these men like to those that fell, because they were rash and unexercised in war. However, with these he came upon the villages of the Babylonians, and a mighty devastation of all things was made there by the injuries that Anilius did them. So the Babylonians and those that had already been in the war sent to Neurda, to the Jews there, and demanded Anilius. But although they did not agree to their demands, for if they had been willing to deliver him up, it was not in their power so to do, yet did they desire to make peace with them. To which the other replied that they also wanted to settle conditions of peace with them and sent men together with the Babylonians, who discoursed with Anilius about them. But the Babylonians, upon taking a view of his situation, and having learned where Anilius and his men lay, fell secretly upon them as they were drunk and fallen asleep, and slew all that they caught of them, without any fear, and killed Anilius himself also. The Babylonians were now freed from Anilius' heavy incursions, which had been a great restraint to the effects of that hatred they bore to the Jews, for if they were almost always at variant, for the reason of the contrariety of their laws, and which party soever grew boldest before the other, they assaulted the other. And at this time in particular it was, that upon the ruin of Anilius's party, the Babylonians attacked the Jews, which made those Jews so vehemently to resent the injuries they received from the Babylonians, that, being neither able to fight them, nor bearing to live with them, they sent to Seleucia, the principal city of those parts, which was built by Seleucus Nicator, it was inhabited by many of the Macedonians, but by more of the Grecians. Not a few of the Syrians also dwelt there. And thither did the Jews fly, and lived there five years, without any misfortunes. 
But on the sixth year, a pestilence came upon these at Babylon, which occasioned new removals of men's habitations out of that city. And because they came to Seleucia, it happened that a still heavier calamity came upon them on that account, which I am going to relate immediately. Now the way of living of the people of Seleucia, who were Greeks and Syrians, was commonly quarrelsome and full of discords, though the Greeks were too hard for the Syrians. When, therefore, the Jews were come thither and dwelt among them, those arose a sedition, and the Syrians were too hard for the other, by the assistance of the Jews, who are men that despise dangers and very ready to fight upon any occasion. Now, when the Greeks had the worst in this sedition, and saw that they had but one way of recovering their former authority, and that was, if they could prevent the agreement between the Jews and the Syrians, they every one discoursed with such of the Syrians as were formerly their acquaintance, and promised they would be at peace and friendship with them. Accordingly, they gladly agreed so to do, and when this was done by the principal men of both nations, they soon agreed to a reconciliation, and when they were so agreed, they both knew that the great design of such their union would be their common hatred to the Jews. Accordingly, they fell upon them, and slew about fifty thousand of them. Nay, the Jews were all destroyed, excepting a few who escaped, either by the compassion which their friends or neighbors afforded them in order to let them fly away. These retired to Tessaphon, a Grecian city, and situated near Seleucia, where the king of Parthia lives in winter every year, and where the greatest part of his riches are deposited. But the Jews had here no certain settlement, those of Seleucia having little concern for the king's honor. Now the whole nation of the Jews were in fear both of the Babylonians and of the Seleucians, because all the Syrians that live in those places agreed with the Seleucians in the war against the Jews. So most of them gathered themselves together, and went to Nierda and Nisibis, and obtained security there by the strength of those cities. Besides which, their inhabitants, who were a great many, were all warlike men. And this was the state of the Jews at this time in Babylonia. End of Book 18